I think it's Stefan. Ah, Stefan. I I'm going to scoop your next paper. Can I be co-author? Okay, we can start the afternoon session. We have Samir Murthy from King's, who will join all what we have seen so far, localization, supergravity, and so on. And we talk about localization in supergravity. Great. Please, Samir. Thanks. So let me begin by thanking the organizers for, for this invitation, or maybe I should say push, to give these lectures. Um, Atish is not here yet. OK. Um, so, ah, there he is. So my title is uh, Quantum Black Hole Entropy and Localization in Supergravity. Um, and what I would like to discuss is a set of ideas about um, the quantum entropy of black holes. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that as we go along. Uh, that have been developed in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and in parallel, there's a set of techniques um, which have been developed to, to address such problems. Um, and the main technique is localization, about which we heard a lot, applied to field theory. And here what we want to do is to apply this technique to, to supersymmetric theories of gravity. So that comes with its own set of challenges um, and problems. Uh, so I'll try to explain that as we go along. Um, so my handwriting is not very good. So at some point of time, I'll try to type up what I write and, and put it on the website. But for now, at least I'll scan in my notes and do it after every lecture. So for now, uh, I think this should be already on the website. There's just a plan of the lectures that I have. Um, so the, uh, I have four lectures, and I've divided it into four parts, uh, roughly corresponding to one part per lecture. Uh, I don't know why it came out like this. I had single pages, but okay, now I'm sure you cannot read it with my handwriting. So uh, I'll just try to um, do it like this. Maybe this is better. So the first part is, um, which is today, which is I'll just tell you about the idea of uh, quantum entropy of black holes. So I'll just uh, review some basic black hole thermodynamics, which I'm sure all of you know, just to put all of us on the same page. Um, then I'll talk about supersymmetric black holes and their classical entropy, and then you know, start to define what quantum entropy means. Um, the second part, which is uh, tomorrow's lecture, will be giving a precise context to it, and the context will be what Stefan discussed very nicely in his first two lectures, namely supersymmetric black holes in four-dimensional um, n equal to two supergravity. And this is an asymptotically flat space. So that's tomorrow. Uh, and then part three is, uh, is the discussion of localization applied to this problem and the computation of exact quantum entropy in, in this class of black holes. And um, part four, so this has a whole bunch of stuff, so maybe Maybe a bit of this will already be tomorrow, and some of this will be on Friday. And then part four is, uh, hmm, this is, ah, uh, so loose ends. Uh, but actually, I replaced this. I, I call this uh, advanced topics, because this looks very, <laughs> looks <laughs> very casual. Um, but based on a little bit of the kind of questions that, that have arisen here about one-loop determinants and so on, so I just want to summarize our, um, you know, status of knowledge about that. I'll just try to go through this in some detail. Um, but applying this to supergravity is, uh, is actually, there are some serious issues there about which um, there's been some progress. Some of it you'll hear in the, in the workshop by, um, in talks of Bernard Dewitt and also of uh, Imtak Jeon, who's here. Who's not here, he's here. Uh, and I'm, hopefully, I'll come, come and, and at least give you an introduction to, to that topic so that you can then uh, really take advantage of those talks. Okay, so today will be just essentially an introduction. Okay, very good. So, um, of course, please uh, feel free to interrupt with questions. And also, if this is not visible, just, just pick up. Uh, I just want to make sure that. Um, Thank you. 
So is this sort of readable in the last row? OK, yeah. Um, no, when I was sitting there, not all the lectures were readable, so just, and no one was picking up. So please tell me if I write something illegible or if I say something you know, which you don't understand. OK, so let's start with some very basic notions. Um, so start with black hole. Uh, so ideally, I should be drawing some kind of space-time diagram, Penrose diagram, but it, it actually helps a lot to keep this very simple-minded picture that there's a black hole with some event horizon, uh, okay, with some radius r. Um, maybe I'll sometimes call this h. Okay, and the story starts. Uh, with the fact that black holes have thermodynamics. So the first statement uh, is that of Wittgenstein. So I'm not being completely um, chronological, but there were lots of works of Wittgenstein and Hawking and collaborators. But I think logically, this is a good way to say it. So, the statement of Bekenstein was that black holes carry thermodynamic entropy. And the argument for this is very simple. I'm sure all of you know it, but just to put everybody on the same page. In fact, so it's the, here's the paper of Bekenstein. And he says, so let's start by considering this very simple thought experiment. Suppose you have a black hole, right? And suppose a body carrying entropy S goes down a black hole. You just throw something which carries energy and entropy and throw it into the black hole. So something like, like this. Okay? You have a body <laughs> which carries a lot of entropy. <laughs> okay? And then um, what you want to do is that um, <laughs> it goes and um, falls inside the black hole. <laughs> okay? so, so actually, Bekenstein had Mexican roots, so I'm sure he, he will be happy with this. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry for the Brazilians. I know there are a few of you. Um, OK. Sorry? <laughs> so I hope uh, Wittgenstein's spirit forgives me for this joke. Um, but anyway, based on this, so you argue the following. You argue that um, there's a generalized second law. Um, and the argument is very simple. It says that consider the second law of thermodynamics. Okay? And you know that the total change in entropy of, of the world the universe should increase. So if you think of this inside and outside of a black hole, so you've lost some entropy from the outside world. So this is entropy of out. Okay, and this is negative, right? But this should be positive. And the only way in which this is even possible is if you in assign an intrinsic entropy to the black hole itself. Okay, so this should be positive. Okay. And that's the argument, that the black hole must have entropy. It's a very simple-minded argument, but a very profound one. And in fact, you can sort of carry this further to say that a black hole must also be the, the thing that packs entropy in the most efficient way, because whatever you throw in, the total entropy has to increase. OK, okay. so now the second uh, statement is that, well, if black holes have uh, Entropy, then they must also, sorry, if the black hole has entropy, they must also have thermodynamics and temperature. And this was a hard calculation, a beautiful one by Hawking. Uh, and so let's say, let's take a spherically symmetric black hole, okay, Schwarzschild black hole. Okay, then, um, so the horizon radius here is 2GM, this R. And Hawking's beautiful calculation showed that the temperature of the black hole is H bar over 2 pi times the Boltzmann constant times the surface gravity. So this is GM over R square. And if you plug that in, You'll find this is equal to h bar 
um, over 4 pi kb uh, times 1 over r. Okay? So that's the temperature. So now use the first law of thermodynamics. Um, and it says that the infinitesimal change in the entropy is uh, dm over t. You just plug that in, and you'll get it's kb over h bar times g times 2 pi um, rdr. So you can integrate this equation now to get the famous formula, which is kb over g h bar c cubed. I've reinserted a c times area of the horizon divided by 4. And this is what we call area of the horizon divided by 4 in Planck units. OK, so that's the famous area law of Bacon, Stern, and Hawking. All right. So it's a very beautiful equation with all the constants, and most of all the fundamental constants of nature appearing. Um, now, in any theory of quantum gravity, we expect that via the Boltzmann equation, this thermodynamic entropy should be equal to Boltzmann constant times the logarithm of the number of microstates of the black hole. Okay. And this should be true in the thermodynamic limit uh, when things simplify. So these dots means that things which depend on the details of the system which just gets washed away in the thermodynamic limit. So when black hole becomes very large, we're just left with this. Okay. Um, and for reasons that will become clear soon, I'm going to call this the classical entropy. I should really be saying semi-class, but it's, it's, it's easier to write class. Okay. Now, um, these little, yeah. S is what? Well, I've made a KB in both cases, so it's. Uh, sorry, KB, thank you. There's a KB here. Any other questions? Yeah, so L Planck square is this, of course. Uh, now, uh, this law of Bacon, Stern, and Hawking is universal in that it applies to any black hole in general relativity. And so that's a very nice thing. Universal laws are good. But it also means that it's, it's, that's a limitation of, it's a self-limiting thing. If you want to understand what, are the, what is the fine structure of gravity, what's the ultraviolet properties of gravity, um, all those things get washed away in this thermodynamic limit. Okay? So if you want to understand the, the quantum structure of gravity, you actually need to understand these corrections. And that's what the notion of quantum entropy is about. So these corrections, you can think of either as um, finite size effects. Okay, and by size, I mean size is the area of the horizon in Planck units. Okay, so that dimensional th dimensionless object I'm going to call size. When the black hole is large, this is correct, and now there are going to be corrections when the black hole, when the curvature is not so small. Okay, and because there's an h bar there, this is also a quantum effects or in fact, because it's actually L Planck, these are quantum gravity effects. Very, very broadly speaking, all these things are true. Okay. So that's what we're interested in. So this, you want to ask, what are these effects? So this whole thing, okay, um, I'm going to call. Um, so this right hand side. I'm going to call S black hole quantum. Okay, and from now on, I'm going to put KB to one, so you don't see this issue. Okay, 
So what I'm asking is really some macroscopic question. So So in Boltzmann's equation, this is micro, and this is macro, OK? And I'm just saying that in a theory of quantum gravity, there must be an equation like this. And the question I'm asking actually is just about the gravitational theory, OK? So let's be a little bit more precise. So let's ask ourselves some questions. So, Uh, so one question is, what is the definition of this thing? So Bekenstein and Hawking gave us the definition of the classical entropy. What is the definition of this quantum entropy? Okay, so it must be something defined in the gravitational theory, which reduces to Bekenstein-Hawking when the area is very large, and otherwise agrees with the logarithm of the number of microstates of the system. Okay. Yes. So once you have the, yeah, you're, so once they have entropy because they have area. That's not how you set up the argument. That's not how I set up the argument. So you should think of extremal black holes as zero temperature limits of non extremal black holes. And in the limiting procedure, if you ask what is, so think of the entropy of the black hole as limit t goes to zero of entropy of a black hole. This we get an area. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. So this ellipsis is suppressed. Yes. If it's a quantum effect. Yes. So should one anticipate some UV sensitivity at some higher order? Absolutely. So that's that's my, actually that was my point. So you said it in a better way than I did. Thanks. What I'm saying is that if you these things are not universal. They depend on the ultraviolet, ultraviolet completion of gravity. In that sense, if you manage to compute this, you actually get some information about the UV theory. Okay. What I'm saying is you can actually try to, comp so there are, just looking ahead a little bit, in string theory, we have sort of two notions of what a black hole is. One is that of some effective theory and a solution and so on with higher derivative and quantum interactions. And the other notion is some microscopic interactions. So the idea is that, Sorry, microscopic excitations of some, some ensemble. The idea is you want to use the, the first effective type description and see how far you can push, push that. And in the supersymmetric case, it turns out that you can go very far with these ideas. OK, thank you. Other questions? Yes? Can the sign of the correctness be positive or negative? Uh, yeah, so in fact, you'll see that uh, they can be positive or negative. They're small compared to this one. But you'll see, actually, that in the one example where I know how to actually compute this all the way to the end, um, sometimes they're negative. It's because they're fermions. Yes? So in, in principle, there are other contributions to the entropy that are not black holes, right? Uh, yeah. Because yes. the entropy is associated to the box. Yes. Which is gravity in general. Indeed. So uh, your, your aim is to compute all the possible contributions that, to the entropy, or just uh, the, the ones from the black hole? I, mean, I, so I, I understand. So the answer is the latter. And just I'll answer this in five minutes. It's a very good question. Um, I'm going to come to that very soon. Other questions? OK, so one question is, what's the definition? Right. The question is, can we compute? Okay in any sensible model. And another question which I'm not going to discuss today is compare to microscopics. Okay. So in string theory, as we all know, to the work of uh, Sen and Strominger and Waffa, we know that a black hole is really some, at least in the supersymmetric situation, is an ensemble of some kind of microscopic states which you can count. And you get some integer here. So the question is, is the exponentials, can, if I can calculate this, is the exponential of this equal to that integer? How far can you go? Okay. Um, what I'll be talking about in this set of lectures is, is just these two topics. Uh, Jean Gomes, who's starting tomorrow, 
we'll talk about the microscopic side of the story. And in my third lecture, and maybe in his third lecture, we'll try to somehow at least into, uh, into it. So just keep an eye out for his lecture and try, try to connect with this, with this, what I'm saying. OK. Now, whatever this, um, I mean, let me make one more comment. Is that this kind of, whatever this quantum entropy is, okay, just based on mathematical analysis, it starts like this. It just starts with this, and then there'll be some logarithmic and power law suppressed, right? And maybe some exponential suppressed corrections. Again, I'm being schematic. Here I'm sort of roughly assuming that AH is the only small, sorry, large, one over AH is the only small uh, parameter in the problem. Sometimes you have more parameters, so it's a multi-dimensional expansion, but roughly speaking, something like this is true. So I'm just putting this out to, to sort of, so that you know what to expect towards the end. Okay, so these are the questions I want to answer. So let me first begin by asking what, what, why at all are there um, these corrections? The origins of, what is the origin of quantum corrections? Well, one obvious answer is the following. You have, so write down the gravitational action. Okay, so it starts like this. Okay. At low energies, it's this coupled to other fields. So this Einstein Hilbert coupled to other fields. Okay. But at higher energies, so whatever the theory of quantum gravity is, I think there's a universal agree agreement that it's not just this, okay? Whether, whatever philosophical bias you might have from an effective field theory point of view, you know that there are operators of this kind that are gonna correct the two derivative low energy action, okay? L Planck square, R square here, I'm schematic, this could be any four derivative term and so on, okay? Now, in the, in such a, with such an effective action, and it's not just GR, the Bekenstein Hawking law does not obey the laws of thermodynamics. I forgot to say this, but I think all of you know that this work of Bekenstein Hawking and uh, Carter and I'm missing one more name, Bardeen, all of they showed that in fact this entropy and that temperature obey the laws of thermodynamics. So the first law I already used, but also that any, in any physical process the second law is true and so on. Okay, so the first even the first law is no longer true for such an action. Okay. Now, this problem has been solved um, with some assumptions. And, oops, I should erase that. Yeah. Um, and there's something called the Wall formula developed by Wald and Ayer and their collaborators. Uh, which says that given some, suppose this is a local effective action. Okay. Then uh, there's a formula which it says that the black hole entropy is, so let's say this is spherically symmetric again. It's something like this. So given some sol black hole solution, you take the action, oops, right, and you take the action, the action can be some complicated thing. There's a set of rules which goes here that you might have some functions of the Riemann tensor. Um, or you, there can be other covariant derivatives and so on. There's a set of rules that when you have anti-symmetrized combinations, you have to make it symmetric and all the anti-symmetric guys you have to write in terms of the Riemann. Then you think of Riemann as an independent object and you just vary the action with respect to this and, and compute this formula. Okay, I'm not going to go in this direction, but this is an extremely well um, understood formula and it's completely explicit. And this obeys the first law of thermodynamics. It was rigged up so as to obey the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, in given some local effective action like this. Okay. Now this is not the direction I want to take because there is another problem which is in a sense 
as interesting and more interesting, namely that in the quantum theory, the correct action of the theory, the correct means one PI action, which respects all the symmetries of the theory, um, need not always be a local effective action because massless particles run in loops. Okay, so suppose you have some loop of this kind. I'm not telling you what observable this is, but something like this. This is going to give you some contribution of this type where epsilon is some IR cutoff, right? And this one versus log epsilon. Okay, and that's certainly non-local. Think of this as some box. You'll have log box or something like this. It's a very non-local effect. And Wall's formalism is not enough to take care of that. So we want some formulation in which you want to think of being able to compute such effects. Okay. So that's what I'm, I'm going to turn to next. Um, so this, so the breakthrough came um, to work by Ashok Sen in 2008 uh, in the context of supersymmetric black holes. Uh, before I go on one technical comment, throughout these lectures, sometimes I'll talk about classical and quantum entropy. So far, I said classical is area over four. Sometimes people also call this wall entropy the classical entropy, just because if there is a local effective Lagrangian which you can minimize, that's like a classical problem. It might have higher derivatives. Okay. And you talk about these loop effects as the quantum effects. So it's a question of semantics, but if I, I might switch between the two. If it's unclear, please ask me. Okay. So look at supersymmetric black holes. So these are extremal zero temperature black holes. And as was already anticipated, the way we should think about it is to think of a very low temperature black hole, compute all physical quantities, and then take the zero temperature limit. That's how we'll think of extremal black holes. And this avoids all kinds of problems which people have invented when you directly take extremal limits, not invented, found. Um, but I think this is the right way to do it. Okay, now the fact is, in the limit, these, these black holes are isolated quantum systems. And that's a very important thing philosophically. And this comes to your question. Sorry, I don't know your name, but the uh, question. Um, so usually, you have a black hole which is interacting with its environment. And to ask, what is the number of states of the black hole? Suppose I want to be ultra powerful and say I want to compute the full integer number of states associated to a black hole. Okay. For a real non-zero temperature black hole, this question is not even well defined because there's Hawking radiation which goes in and out. So you can't say that this quantum belongs into the black hole or outside. It's only the full ensemble, the box, as you said, which has a well-defined entropy. But there, you might have um, a canonical ensemble. Okay. So that's, those are the kind of things which one has to compute. But for extreme or supersymmetric black holes, they have zero temperature. They're completely quiet objects. And they're isolated quantum systems. So there is a sense in, in asking, what is the number of quantum states associated to that black hole? And that's the question I want to answer. Okay, So that's an important point. Um, so let's then do this. In order to do this, so the, the first idea is that the entropy of a black hole is somehow stored um, near or behind the horizon of the black hole. The horizon is the, is the reason why there is an entropy. Okay? So the first step is to, is to sort of look, go near horizon. Um, and before going to the quantum entropy, I want to do an exercise, which was done by various people, some of whom may be here, namely to express this classical entropy, this wall entropy, for the case of supersymmetric black holes as a quantity which you can purely compute in the near horizon region. Okay, So let me do that. And in fact, so there are two advantages. Firstly, you'll see very soon, it's a very elegant formulation. It's a very simple formulation. And secondly, it allows us to go beyond um, and define quantum entropy. Okay, So I'm going to take some kind of near horizon limit. And in order to do this, I'll, I'll just be very specific just for now. Let me talk about this Einstein-Maxwell theory in four dimensions. Okay, um, 16 by, sorry. 
OK, so there is, in fact, Stefan even wrote the rice nylon solution. I'm going to repeat it uh, in slightly different variables. So here is the solution. It's 1 minus rho plus over rho, 1 minus rho minus over rho, uh, d tau square, tau is time, plus d rho square over 1, this thing, plus rho square d omega 2 square, and it's going to be more precise, d psi square plus sine square psi d phi square. Okay, so that's your Reisner Nostrum solution. And if you take the extremal limit, what you'll find is that, uh, so first I should tell you more about this. Oops finish the solution. So there are two parameters, rho plus and rho minus. This is not how Stefan presented it, I think, but it's completely equal. And I should also tell you what the fields are, uh, electric fields, are, uh, gauge fields are. So there's an F rho tau. So these are charged black holes. And there's an electric charge Q here. And in fact, you can also take a black hole, which is dionic. So let's take that. That's the most general thing. P sine psi. Okay, and rho plus and rho minus uh, are the positions of the two event horizons, which are defined like so. Rho plus plus rho minus is 2gm, and rho plus times rho minus is g over 4 pi times q squared plus p squared. Okay, so that's the rational nostrum solution in, in all detail. And the extremal limit. It's a limit in which the two horizons um, coalesce, rho plus. Both of them go to a common value, which I'm going to call rho horizon, rho h. And that turns out to be equal to square root of g times q squared plus p squared over 4 pi. And m. m oops, equals 1 over 4 pi g times q squared plus p squared. Okay, so that's the extremal limit. So the mass is completely determined by the charges and the two horizons coalesce. Yes? Yes, so I haven't yet done that. That's exactly what I'm going to do next. Let me just do it, and then you can ask a question if it remains. So now what I want to do is, so so far I haven't talked about the near horizon limit. So I want to take a near horizon limit, but I want to take a simultaneous limit. So th this is the comment I made earlier. So what I want to do is to go to some, take a scaling limit where I go near the horizon, but always keep the horizon at a finite distance. So if I do this naively, then the horizon goes up to infinity. But I want to do it in a way that I keep it at a finite distance. So this is the way to do it. So you do take a simultaneous extremal plus near horizon limit as follows. So you do rho plus minus rho minus is 2 lambda, and I'm going to take lambda to 0. At the same time, I have to take rho minus rho horizon equals lambda times r. I'm going to define a new variable called r. Okay. And tau, so if I do this and look at the metric, you'll see that tau also has to be rescaled in the other way. Otherwise, there's no sensible metric. So tau over rho h square is t over lambda. Okay, and then I take lambda goes to zero. Okay. In doing so, what I've effectively done, oh, let me finish the, the analysis. So what I get is that the metric is V times minus R square minus 1 dt square plus dr square over R square minus 1 plus d omega 2 square. 
okay? Where V is rho h square. Okay, so this side just freezes to the horizon. Here, so this is an S2, and this is two-dimensional anti Dissiter space. Okay? But just to answer your question, I think there was another question about this. It's no, not yours, someone else's. That I've done this in a way such that effectively this also looks like there are two horizons to it, although it's all in the near horizon limit, and that's, that's important. Okay. Um, so what you get is some near horizon limit uh, to be ADS2 times S2. Now this fact is, um, oh, sorry, and what happens to the, the gauge field? So F equals, um, let me write it as E over 4 pi times dr wedge dt uh, plus p over 4 pi sine psi d psi wedge d phi. OK? So what I get is ADS2 times S2, and I get constant electric and magnetic field. Okay, So for those of you who have never seen it, I recommend this exercise. I've spelled out everything. It'll take you less than 10 minutes, but it's nice to do it. Okay, uh, Where E um, equals, hmm. where E equals Q. Okay, so it's just Q over 4 pi and P over 4 pi. Okay. So that's what you get in this regime. Yes, question. Ah, oh, this should be T. Thank you. It's not so, tau has disappeared from the story. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Now this fact. So it's very easy to do in this this uh, metric, but, and for this theory. In fact, this is much more general. So let's stick to four dimensions, and give ourselves an arbitrary theory. of the metric coupled to some bunch of gauge fields and a bunch of scalar fields and maybe fermions. This is the kind of theory we've been seeing in the last few days. Okay, so suppose you have, so this is very general. So this is general. So suppose you give yourself S, which is B for X, square root of minus G, times some Lagrangian of metric, some bunch of scalar fields, a mu, i, and some bunch of, um, sorry, bunch of gauge fields, bunch of scalar fields, phi a, and maybe fermions, OK? This is still true. You always get in the near horizon limit an ADS2 times S2 in this theory, in, in, in asymptotically flat space, just one second. Um, the changes are that let me take the question because I'm going to take two minutes to explain it. Huh? So, is this a black hole or not? Does what? It have any singularity somewhere? The Reissner Nostrum. This one, the one with the near horizon. This is just ADS2 times S2. This is the near horizon geometry of the black hole. Sorry? You've, you've really gone to the horizon and, and taken that patch near the horizon, and that's what this is. Right? I mean, in the Penrose diagram, the horizon looks like that. You really have some very small patch next to it. That's this. OK, so what happens is that this is much more general. So given any such Lagrangian, you write a, a rational Nostrum type solution. So there's some, with some electric and magnetic charges. Now, the near horizon region of the supersymmetric or extremal black hole always has ADS2 times S2 symmetry. So this means there's an SL2 associated with this and an SU2 associated with this. And in fact, one can just write down directly uh, what the near horizon uh, geometry should be. So this always looks like ADS2 times S2 with some um, uh, value of V. The field strengths become constant because those are the only things allowed by the symmetries. And now, uh, where should I write it? Uh, 
So comma, I'll go on. Uh, I wanted to fit it here. Comma, uh, so <coughs> phi A is also constant, and all the fermions are zero. Okay, so these are the, this is the most general configuration uh, consistent with the symmetries. And this relation that the electric field was equal to the charge for one uh, uh, gauge field now gets changed that E, E i is a function of all the QIs. Okay? Yes? So the near horizon is a very thin shell. Yes, right yes, now, yes, that's right, that's right, yes. Yeah, so, so, so this is still true. Okay, this is true. Now V is some V constant. Fi becomes Ei plus Pi. Ei is some function of the electric fields. Scalars are constant and fermions are zero. But that's when we choose these specific limiting behaviors, right? We are taking two limits. At the same time, yes, yes, yes. So that's the one. That's correct. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Okay. And now in this limit, uh, sorry, in this near horizon configuration, this Lagrangian effectively becomes just a function. This was a functional of all these fields. Now it just becomes a function of, of course, Q1 P, QI, PI, semicolon. Now it's just the parameters, V, EI, uh, phi, A. I hope I didn't miss anything. Sorry? Is there a question? Yes. Is that an exact solution of the That's that's a solution. That's a solution in its own right. So maybe I said this too. How do you mean exact? It's a solution. You say it's the near horizon limit of a solution. So so yeah, that's the first statement. But then it's a solution in its own right, meaning that that is a solution, right? Right. Now, so I, I showed you this. Sorry. So. I should have added one sentence. So in the case of just Maxwell Einstein, you start with rational Nash term, take the limit, you get this thing. I should have added a sentence saying that itself solves the equation of motion. And this fact is much more general that you can, and I'm saying that there's a very easy way to do it. You just assume the symmetries of the near horizon, SL2 times SU2, and that's the most general configuration I can write down, consistent with the symmetries. And the Lagrange, I still haven't solved the equation of motion, just give me a second, but there is, you'll see that this is a solution. The Lagrangian, now becomes a function of these fields, of these numbers, of these uh, just real variables. Okay, so what was a complicated, what was GR now just becomes multivariable calculus. Okay, and now, um, in fact, this is very general. It's not just general, but very general, in the sense that it's also true if you don't have four dimensions. So what then uh, changes is is this part. Okay. Of course, if you don't have four dimensions, if you have five dimensions, there'll be something else. So what this correct statement is now, you always have ADS2 times a compact manifold. Okay. And it's, so you can be any dimension, any D, and any theory. So including the type of theory that Stefan talked about in his second, sorry, in his third and fourth lectures. You need not have a symptotically flat space. The kind of thing that Alberto was talking about, you can have ADS2 times some Riemann surface. Now S3, whatever. So the statement is that as long as there's a consistent limit to GR, the, the near horizon region always has an ADS2 factor, ADS2 times a compact factor, constant um, electric fields, and these magnetic fields now become some scalar fields after think, think of it as a two-dimensional theory, um, and constant scalar fields. Okay? So what we're going to do is to think of this as some two-dimensional theory on ADS2. Okay, just compactify the compact part. Think about it as a two-dimensional theory. So, yes. So, so this is thus far a very classical statement about equation of motion. It's still very, I'll finish here, I'll finish the classical thing here. It's too big quantum uh, inconsistently from the quantum point of view. Sorry, it could be what, quantum what? At the quantum point of view, this could, not, this could be a truncation that is not. Yeah, so I'll discuss that uh, once I start here. Just, just give me five minutes. I'll, yes. So, so what are the uh, independent parameters? Yes, so I'm just. So the charges are just given to you. The parameters that vary are the size v. But v should be related to the charges. Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll come to that. So, so I'm saying that the most general, 
so maybe I should have done the whole thing. I was trying to be quick. The most general near horizon, most general configuration consistent with the near horizon symmetries is this, where V is arbitrary, E i are arbitrary, and in this case, P i is arbitrary, and phi i arbitrary. Okay. But now you have to impose equations of motion. And here's the statement. So firstly, I wanted to say that it's not just four-dimensional with spherical symmetry. So it's even more general than that. So in that case, this L, um, you should think of some two-dimensional Lagrangian, okay, which comes from compactifying this higher dimensional Lagrangian. In our case, it's just equal to uh, V sine theta, uh, sorry, sine psi d phi times uh, L of the four dimensions, right? And this is just 4 pi V L. Okay? And S is just another integration of that, and you get a V of this two dimensional thing, right? Just look at the metric. There's a V in front of the ADS2. So the square root of G of this two dimensional part is also V, and this part is also V, and that explains all these factors of V that I've been pulling out. Okay, I just do the integration over the two dimensions, I get this. I do a further integration over the ADS2, I get this. Okay? And now, um, so is that clear? Was that too quick there? Okay. So now comes the statement. The statement is that, uh, I should hurry. The statement is that the, there's something called a classical entropy function, which are defined as follows. E is function of qi pi, semicolon. V, so those are fixed. V, ei, phi a, which is defined to be 2 pi times ei times qi minus v times l2. Okay, it's just a Lajano transform of the action of the theory <coughs> with respect to the electric fields. Okay? And <coughs> the two statements are then one. The equation of motion of the theory implies it's just exactly the same as a variational principle, delta E equal to zero. And I said this is just multivariable calculus. So that means what I mean is D E d v is zero, d e d e uh, phi a equal to zero, and d e d e i equal to zero. Okay. So what I've done, what the statement is that if you just take your Lagrangian, think of Einstein-Hilbert coupled to Maxwell, right? plug in these ansatz. What I'm saying is that the near horizon symmetries have completely fixed the tensor structures completely. So the only things that are left to vary are the sizes. So the shapes have been fixed by either supersymmetry or extremality, as you want to think it. The only things that are left are the sizes. Those are just some real parameters. And the equations of motion then just become this extremization problem. Okay? So this is just extremization. Okay? And notice in particular that this is the same. Oops, sorry. This one is the same as saying that qi is d v l2 d e i, which is the same as Gauss law. Okay, so that's the comment which we're going to use later. And part two of the statement is that the, the classical entropy of a black hole, of the black hole, is the value of E at this extreme. Okay. So I'm not going to derive this for you. You can think of, so please take this as an exercise. That one is, they're both sort of medium level exercises. Um, if you want to look at it, there's a nice review paper by Ashok Sen in 2007. You can you know, do this, or Su Jong Ray sitting there. He's also worked on it, you can bug him. Um, but anyway, this is not a very difficult problem in my opinion. Okay, so that's the classical entropy <coughs> statement. Okay, any other questions about this? Did I answer all questions or did I postpone something which I still haven't answered? There was, uh, Leopoldo, did you, uh, it's clear now? 
Hmm. I ask you again. Quantum, quantum, but I'm going to come to that in a second. Yes. So, that is implied that somehow the reason why this work is consistent Well, so for the classical level, it's just you can prove it, right? As I said, all tensor structures are fixed, and there's nothing else. You can do the whole. If you can do it in high, you can do it as a two-dimensional problem or a five-dimensional, four-dimensional problem. It doesn't matter, because, right? Because of the symmetries. I mean, here I'm assuming there's a lot of symmetry. If not, suppose this thing is some Riemann surface, like right. Albert. Then that you'll have more complicated problems. Yeah. That's right. But okay. So in this case, uh, let, let, let's, let me be careful and say this. <laughs> OK, the main point is this. Okay, the equation imply, implies that. That's always true. And then the entropy is equal to that. OK? Uh, under a large, for, uh, more or less the other way is also true, but let me not commit right here. We can discuss this later on. Sorry, you said that so this is for any dimension, and yeah. you wrote any theory. What do you mean by any theory? So it, before writing here, before general and very general, I said, let's stick to four-dimensional asymptotically flat space. But this statement is true even for when I break such assumptions. So the kind of theories that Alberto was discussing, Stefan was discussing, all of that is just true. OK, now. Sorry, but this is true for non No, no, no. Of course, I'm assuming supersymmetry. So, so what I've assumed here is extremality, actually. right? So that was my assumption in, in looking at rational Nostrum. Um, but that was because I'm interested in supersymmetric black holes, which then become extremal. So the, Technical assumption so far is extremality. Yes? Uh, is the Schrodinger symmetry also a function? No, so, so that's what I said. So before, so the first example I did was spherically symmetric. Then it remains spherically symmetric, but the Lagrangian changes. Now I'm saying even that's not true. Any theory arbitrary? OK. All right. Of course, the details will change. If you have some other symmetry, this is not a sphere. It will be something else. OK, now let's come to the quantum entropy. <clears throat> also not for rotating black holes. Sorry? Also do not apply for rotating No, no, so far I, it's, it's completely general. What I said was completely general. Sorry, I want to stress this. <laughs> Try to say this as <laughs> I really mean any theory. So the only assumption I've made is extremality or, or so soon I'll say supersymmetry, but so far it's just extremality. Okay. But now I'm going to go towards something more specific, um, and and then maybe at the end tell you about the general generalities. Sorry, who's the chair? Can I take five more minutes because I have lots of questions already? I mean, I have uh, five minutes left. That's great. Please continue like this. But it's just that I want to do one little thing before I finish. So I've restated the, so if you want that, you can think of that as a definition of an extremal black hole, that in its near horizon limit, there's always that. That, def, that fact is true for, you can prove that is true for, again, an arbitrary theory of gravity coupled to matter. Any extremal black hole, as long as it has a, a, a limit to Einstein's theory, in the sense that the corrections that I put to Einstein's theory must be small. If I Within that set of assumptions, you can prove this. Right? The, I forgot who did it. It was Kunduri, Lucia, these, a bunch of these people. Um, but otherwise, for our purposes, you can just take that to be the definition. So you've identified the entropy with the what about on shell value of this function. That's correct. That which involves the Lagrangian. That's correct. What if I add a total derivative to the Lagrangian? Huh? What if I add a total derivative? Total derivative. Yes. The value of the entropy will change. Or, I mean, there's an ambiguity there fixing, fixing L. Or you can show that that will not contribute. Uh, no, I think I've not made any assumptions of that sort. So I think it's because these are constants. I think any Lagrangian is OK. Can we just postpone this for a bit? I think that's correct, but let me just think it through. 
Okay, so what I want to do now in the last X minutes um, is define the notion of quantum entropy. Okay, so the classical entropy problem has been recast as an extremization problem in the near horizon geometry. Okay, so since um, the idea was that the quantum entropy for supersymmetric black holes should be a functional integral. So the classical problem is an extremization. As, as was said, there's an on-shell problem. So now you make it off-shell. You integrate over, over all the fields. Okay? So that's, that's the sort of moral idea. So extremization now is promoted to a path integral. Okay? So what I want to tell you next is how to do it in the next five, ten minutes. So the first thing I want to do is to go Euclidean because otherwise my path integral is not well defined. So in order to do that, I'm going to take t to i theta. So what I'll have here is now the classical problem will become plus. It's become theta square. And here I'll get a minus i times ei. Okay, so that's the only effect on these fields, All right? And now, what is the idea? So Euclid, so that's Euclidean ADS2. So that looks like a disk, it's a hyperbolic disk with some asymptotic boundary. And the idea is that, so the, in the classical problem, everything is constant, as we just saw. In the quantum problem, I want to fix the boundary conditions according to the classical problem. And then in the interior, I want to let all the fields fluctuate, okay, and integrate over these fields. Okay, so let me set that up. So I need some fall-off conditions. So as R goes to infinity, I want to say that G mu nu is that classical one, which is on the other blackboard, times 1 plus O of 1 over R squared. A mu is A mu i classical, which is there, times 1 plus O of 1 over R. Phi A is Phi A classical, which is constant, times 1 plus O of 1 over R. Okay? Now people have analyzed this, that this is sort of consistent boundary conditions. So another way to say this is that the ds square in the ADS2 part will now become like this V times r square plus some o of 1 times d theta square plus dr square times 1 over r square plus o of 1 over r to the fourth. Okay, that's the kind of fluctuation I'm going to take. And ai is minus i ei times r plus o of 1, o of 1. And phi a is constant phi a plus 1 over r. constant plus 1 over r. Okay, and now, given these conditions, I'm going to define the quantum entropy. So now I think I can erase this. I, I, I don't actually need too much more time, so it's fine. I'm going to define the quantum entropy as follows. So e to the s quantum entropy of a black hole is the path integral z over ADS2. It's a function of qi and pi, which is defined as the expectation value in the quantum theory of the exponential of minus i qi times the Wilson line of all the gauge fields under which um, is charged. And this Wilson line is placed at the boundary of ADS2 as R goes to infinity. And this is with asymptotic ADS2 boundary conditions of the type that I just said. And there's a certain renormalization that you have to do, which is what I call finite. Okay. So that's the definition. And I want to spend just maybe five minutes in just as, at least explaining how one should think of this path integral. And th then next time, I'll pick up with that. Okay. So. This is Euclidean ADS2. I'm going to put a cutoff uh, at R0. So there are many, many issues with this, with this pattern. So I've, I've just, uh, 
So the way, what is the definition? You think of the two-dimensional theory. This includes gravity and all the fields that you have, okay? All the, whatever fields are in the theory. And then there is this Wilson line. According to all the electric charges of the black hole, the magnetic charges in two-dimensional description become some scalar fields. I give myself these boundary conditions and integrate over all fluctuations. What are the issues? The issues is, well, firstly, um, how should I think of this integral? I really think of it as an integral d over all the fields, e to the minus exponential times this. Many issues with this. One issue is that this action itself is divergent because the volume of ADS2 is divergent. Okay, so this is an infrared problem from the point of view of gravity. So let's first um, tackle that. So think of some bulk action, which is what our Lagrangian was. So you have dr0 from some interior to, sorry, dr from something to r0, and d theta square root of g times L bulk, whatever your Lagrangian is. Now remember that the Lagrangian evaluated on the classical field started with a constant. We already saw that. And therefore, this thing will start as, as something like that. Okay, so constant times the volume, the volume is, is R0. It, it, it diverges as R0. So it's going to start like this. Then there's going to be some finite piece. And then there's going to be some 1 over R piece. Okay. This is going to be my definition of the finite part. Okay, so in, in general, in ADS CFT or in ADS, when you think of ADS quantum gravity, as, in, as we heard in Yanis' lectures, there's a whole procedure of holographic renormalization, and that's what you should really apply here. It actually just becomes very, very simple, and I'll make some comments about this, because the only divergence is this linear divergence, which you can essentially subtract using a cosmological constant. I'll make some more comments about this. But for now, you can just take this as the definition. Just take this C1 to be the finite piece. Just one second. Now, similarly, for the Wilson line, so think of now the Wilson line lives on the boundary. The proper length of the boundary, right? if you just integrate the length, you'll get v square root of v times uh, 2 pi times r0. And therefore, the Wilson line E i, Q, uh, sorry, Q i times integral A i also goes similar behavior. There is some R naught piece, okay, plus some C one prime piece plus order of one over R. And again, I'm going to take this, okay. And a better way to say this, so I'm going to define something called a renormalized action, which is S bulk plus, uh, sorry, minus i Q i integral AI plus some boundary term, boundary counter term that I have to add. And you choose it so as to cancel these leading order divergences. And I'll make comments about this after I finish. Um, and now with this definition, ZADS2, I should really think of as really a path integral, D of all the fields, phi gravitational, which this metric, et cetera, et cetera, times e to the minus s renormalized of these phi gravitation. OK. And now I'm going to say one more thing and then stop. So suppose you want to take the classical limit. That's the first thing to check. So when the black hole is large, that implies v goes to infinity. Remember, v was the size of the horizon. And if v goes to infinity, remember L, the Lagrangian, started its life by with a term which is proportional to v. There was a v times L2 in what I wrote. Therefore, the action grows. Therefore, you can do a saddle point approximation. That's just saying that in the classical limit, you have a saddle point because that v, there's a 1 over h bar in front of v. And in that case, the s bulk, let's be more careful. So r not remember, sorry, r went from 1 to r not. 
d theta went from 0 to 2 pi v times L2. So, this is just 2 pi times just this is a constant in the classical limit r naught minus 1 times v L2 and minus i q i integral e i is just minus 2 pi times q i e i times r naught minus 1 and that implies that S renormalized is just 2 pi times this is the finite part. So, it's there is this one and there is this one. Okay, I just drop the r. So, just get q i e i minus v l 2 and that is precisely what the classical entropy was. So, this is not a surprise. Of course, I have started with the classical thing and went up to the uh, fluctuation problem, but just to make sure that everything is consistent. Um, so, if you do the saddle point evaluation of that, you get that. So, so in this limit, you get s e to the s quantum okay, just reduces to e to the s classical uh, okay. So, this is just s classical right yeah. Okay, so, I think I will stop there next time what I am going to do is to as I said apply this to this n equal to 2 uh, black holes and then we will take it from there. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'd already postponed some questions.